History isn't black and white, yet too often it's presented as such. Grey History is a history podcast dedicated to exploring the ambiguities and nuances of the past. A show that seeks to explore the contention and the debate, along with the simple who, what, when. The current season is focused on the French Revolution, an era vitally important to understanding the world we live in today, and a period that no one can agree on just about anything. Hear the contradicting experiences and conclusions of both contemporaries and historians as we explore the grey in detail. And I do mean in detail. We're 50 hours in and the king is still alive. Although, admittedly, only just. So, if you're looking for your next binge-worthy long-form history podcast, one that's used by universities across the world, check out Grey History the French Revolution today. That's G-R-E-Y. On October 26, 1733, Nather, the imposing chief servant and regent of the Iranian Empire, rode alongside a small entourage of his cavalry officers, all of whom were sweaty, splattered with blood and grime from the hard-fought battle, yet reveling in their recent victory, while taking in the entirety of the grisly scene before them. Led by a Persian horseman, carrying a gruesome trophy, and that was guiding them to a specific location in field, while trying to carefully navigate his mount through the slew of bodies that carpeted the grounds just outside the city of Kirkuk, in what today would be modern north-central Iraq, the site of the recent battle. That among the fallen, the group was quickly able to ascertain that the Ottoman troops had suffered the vast majority of the casualties later counted to over 20,000, in contrast to only somewhere between 1 to 2,000 Iranians slain in the brutal contest, denoting yet another overwhelming victory engineered by Nadar, the axe now resting in his belt, having also claimed the lives of numerous Turkish soldiers. The gruesome trophy carried by the cavalrymen leading the group being the severed head of the renowned Ottoman general Topol Osman Pasha, with the mounted warrior soon coming to a halt, pointing to the grounds where he had won his prize, to where Nader had commanded him to bring Topol's head to be reunited with his body. With this done, Nader dismounting from his horse, all the officers and soldiers around him falling into silence, following the lead of their commander who stood there, quietly looking upon the frail and broken corpse of his worthy adversary, and the only man to have bested him in battle, that just three months prior had leveled a devastating defeat on Nader and the Iranian army. 33,000 Persians lost at Samara, over a third of their strength. Beyond that dismal result, also threatening to cast Nader into oblivion, tainting the veneer of him being favored by God to lead, and revolts breaking out in southern Iran calling for his removal as regent, forcing Nader, within an incredibly short sequence of time, to rebuild his army, in what can only be described as a fantastical recovery, before promptly returning to the field to avenge the loss. Perhaps, all of these thoughts assailing Nader's senses as he stood there despondently, giving Topol Osman Pasha one final look before ordering a nearby officer to have his body conveyed to Baghdad to be buried with full honors. Then, remounting his steed, the Iranian troops around him bowing in reverence, with Nader coming to the realization that in having avenged the loss, that dire setback that he had just crossed the threshold of rebuilding his God-favored image, and that would immediately work to, once again, set him on the path to the Iranian throne. (laughs) 
Welcome to the Warlords of History podcast. I'm your host, Mark Pimenta. Part 5 of the series on Nader Shah, the last of the great Asiatic military conquerors, the brilliant battlefield commander that would come to salvage and later rule 18th century Iran, remaking his nation into a militaristic superpower. A valid but obviously simplistic interpretation of the path that Nader followed throughout his lifetime to get there. As we now know, a path fraught with tremendous struggle from its very beginning. As a poverty-stricken and insignificant youth, growing up within the backdrop of a chaotically violent and unforgiving environment, that he became a product of and would excel in, tempered into an exceptionally skilled warrior and leader with a mind possessing tactical genius for military affairs, while also imbuing him with an unshakable will and ravenous ambition. And despite being confronted with considerable setbacks and reversals of fortune throughout his career, including one particularly serious failure that we'll later get to in this episode, he remained relentless in his pursuit of his ultimate goals while employing various novel approaches to reach them, like strapping light cannons onto a horde of camels and putting them in his army. Just one example of the type of thinking by which Nader managed to persevere through all of these challenges, surprise his adversaries, and continually emerge out from the reversals of fortune stronger than ever. But before we get to all of this, and the camels, it's time for some supporter shoutouts, because I have the great pleasure of welcoming Wayne Klingman, Patrick Cunningham, and Tora Ardal as the newest inductees into the ranks of the Warlords of History Immortals. My deepest gratitude goes to you and the existing Immortals for supporting the show through the Warlords of History Patreon page. All right, now, quick reminder that this episode marks the fifth installment of the multi-part series unpacking the lifetime and exploits of Nader Shah. So, if you haven't been able to as of yet, I would suggest having a listen of parts one through four first, to gain a more holistic picture of the storyline as it relates to the events and people that we'll be discussing here. But nonetheless, Here's a quick little summary of what we encountered in the last episode to help bring you up to speed or remind you as to where we last left things off. With Nader, in late 1729, liberating the city of Isfahan from the Afghan Hotax, restoring Shah Tamas II of the Safavid royal dynasty to the helm of the Iranian Empire. With this largely being a charade, Nader in control of the Persian army and situated as the unofficial authority behind the throne, controlling Shah Tamasp and angling for more power, while beginning to chip away at the Safavid, God-ordained right to rulership. By introducing the notion that, although not possessing a notable lineage himself, his right to authority was being driven according to the will of Allah as one clearly favored by God, evidenced by all his successes to date, particularly his battlefield victories. And in the attempt to build upon this and gain wider support among the Persian nobility and clergy, months later, in the dawning of 1730, kicking off a lightning-fast and overwhelmingly successful campaign against the Ottoman Empire to reclaim Iran's western domains followed by the liberation of Tabriz in the northwest, leaving only Iran's Caucasus territories in the hands of the Ottomans, an endeavor that he was interrupted from pursuing due to the Afghan Abdali rebellion that had sparked in the city of Herat, threatening his homeland and power base of Khorasan, forcing Nader to race his finely tuned and rigorously trained army across the width of Iran, to eventually squash the rebellion, yes, but through a painstakingly long process. 
Nather's prolonged absence from the Iranian capital, however, giving Shah Tamasp the breathing space to reassert his leadership. And in a last-ditch effort to neutralize Nather's growing influence, Tamasp, deciding to undertake a military expedition against the Ottomans in the Caucasus to finish off what Nader had been unable to complete, in the aim to convince the Persian aristocracy that the Safavid divine right to rulership remained a valid one. However, Tamasp's campaign going horribly awry, ending in sheer disaster and humiliation, handing Nader the key opportunity he had been waiting for to not only strengthen, but transform his unofficial position of authority into something much more tangible. Returning to Isfahan in August 1732 to have Tamas deposed and replaced by his infant son, Abbas III, as Shah, with Nader elected as regent, granting him unparalleled official authority and powers to guide the Iranian Empire back to its former glories. Bringing us back to where we had left everything off in part 4. With Nader at the capital of Isfahan through the balance of 1732 tenaciously throwing himself into this task. Administering the empire with few restraints to his authority as regent, while undertaking extensive preparations for the resumption of war against the Ottomans in order to avenge the humiliating defeat that his nation had been recently served. The unmitigated disaster created by the now deposed Tamas II, who was shipped far off to Mashhad and imprisoned, unable to stir up any further trouble. Interestingly though, not executed outright, because Nather must have concluded that any such overt actions would have resulted in stronger internal opposition to his regency, since it was rather apparent that some of the Persian aristocracy and leading religious figures were unsettled with the new lay of the political landscape and how Tamas had been pushed aside. No loud complaints issued, since that would have resulted into a similar fate or worse to what had befallen Tamas, but more in terms of whispering chatter and rumor. Although the throne was indeed within reach, closer than ever to Nather, he gauged it prudent to take it one step at a time, until his authority was unassailable. And as you've probably gathered by now, Nather was a clever, but certainly patient man, his notable knack for strategy and timing going beyond that of the battlefield, understanding, at least for appearance's sake, that a Safavid still had to be on the throne for now. Their credibility and claim to rulership tarnished, sullied further by Tamasp, but not yet extinguished. And since the new Shah, Abbas III, was but an infant, Nader was in a prime position to preside over the affairs of the empire without interference, while continuing to build the base of unassailable support he was after the foundation of which was the Iranian military, with Nader in the latter half of 1732 assembling a tremendous field army of nearly 120,000 to take the Ottomans on. Now, I have to include here that historical accounts don't provide clear details on the exact configuration of the army, so we'll have to work with a range of estimates provided by more recent assessments. From what I've been able to gather, this force including approximately 50,000 musket-bearing infantry, 8 to 10,000 of which were his elite Jazayirchi troops, with their heavy, long-range Jazayir muskets, and around 60,000 cavalry, the rest being artillery and support units, such as those working in the mobile artillery workshop that traveled around with him, engineers and some general laborers. All, of course required to endure the heavy cadence of training and drilling that Nader was known to subject his troops to. But what makes this group even more fascinating is how multi-ethnic they were, people from all across Persia, including, but not limited to, native Persians, Kurds, and Afghans, 
and the large tribal contingents that made up the cavalry, such as the Abdali Afghans and the Turkic-originating tribes that made up the Kizilbash. With Nader not even close to stopping there, also commanding more state funds to be dedicated towards the future expansion of his army. Then in late 1732, or early in 1733, marching out from Isfahan. Nader first commanding one of his generals to take somewhere in the realm of 15 to 20,000 cavalry to the northwest, basing themselves at Tabriz to begin raiding and biting out at the Turkish positions in and around modern Azerbaijan and Armenia, seemingly making ready for a broader assault there. That convinced the Ottomans to respond by heavily reinforcing their troop count in the area, in anticipation of the impending attack. Underneath the shroud of all of this troop movement, Nader also using his time in Isfahan to engage the court of Empress Anna Ivanovna of the Russian Empire, conducting some rather savvy and shrewd diplomacy, understanding that their deteriorating relations with the Ottoman Empire was bringing them closer to the edge of war, in addition to Russia being on the eve of getting caught up in another conflict, the War of Polish Succession that would erupt later in 1733, an environment that neither wisely determined he could use to his distinct advantage. Aided by the fact, like all the nations surrounding Iran's borders, the Russians were, by that point, well aware of Nader's surging power and battlefield prowess, above all, not wanting to tangle with him and the Ottomans at the same time. All of these factors adding together to provide Nader with the necessary leverage to negotiate and strike quite the favorable deal with Empress Ivanovna, in the form of a Russo-Iranian alliance against the Ottoman Empire, in exchange for Russia handing back all of the territories in northern and northwestern Iran that they had overtaken 10 years prior in 1723, resulting in yet more of the Iranian Empire reclaimed, and Nader's regency off to a spectacular start. With Nader determined to continue this reclamation by force, once again setting his sights on the Ottomans, as mentioned in sending large detachments of his cavalry to Tabriz, in what was believed to be the advanced guard or precursor to the arrival of the main Persian army. That was, in actuality, a ploy. The force sent to Tabriz intended as a defensive contingent, to keep the city well defended, while also acting as a clever feint in order to catch the Ottomans off guard and strike them where not expected. Nader marching out from Isfahan, at the head of his immense 100,000 strong army, not towards the Caucasus region, but instead marching 900 kilometers west from the Iranian capital to Baghdad in what would be called Nader's Mesopotamian campaign. Traveling through the narrow valleys and sky-reaching summits of the Zagros mountain range, using the most direct and well-established route, aiming to gain access to the Mesopotamian basin by emerging out of the mountains near the modern-day Iraqi town of Mandali, near today's Iran-Iraq border, roughly 150 kilometers east of Baghdad. An approach that indeed caught the Ottomans by surprise, since they didn't have a large army in the area, with the bulk of their forces gathered in the north. However, one that Turkish scouts were able to spy out, bringing Ahmed Pasha, the governor of Baghdad, some advanced warning of their impending arrival, and just enough time to scrape together a small army to block their path, estimated at around 10 to 12,000. Small, yes, but that were well dug in and positioned at a key mountain pass en route to Mandali and that would have very likely resulted in ruinous casualties to the Persian army in trying to break through. A response that Nader, the tactical military genius that he was, had anticipated and planned for. At some point, earlier on from departing from Isfahan, peeling off 7,000 soldiers, 
a mixture of infantry and cavalry, which he personally led northwest through the Zagros Mountains, using local guides to blaze a new trail, a treacherous march that reportedly claimed the lives of several of his troops and horses, but that ultimately allowed them to emerge undetected into the Mesopotamian basin, 150 kilometers north of Mandali, where the Ottomans were blocking the main Iranian army. Nader, taking great pains to remain unseen while leading his force of 7,000 southwards, before, in the dead of night, launching a surprise assault that severely mauled the Ottoman force, who were completely outwitted and unprepared for an attack at their backs, thus clearing the path to Baghdad. As a quick side note, this rather sneaky and well-timed maneuver through the mountains being one of the hallmarks of Nader's military strategy, placing great emphasis on the mobility of his army, using this in combination with surprising marches to a devastating effect, something we'll see more of in future campaigns. And while Ahmed Pasha, in learning of the disaster, had then ordered the bridges across the Tigris River destroyed, one of Nader's engineers reportedly came up with quite the innovative solution, in the form of floating bridges, constructed of palm trees that were tied together and laid upon inflated animal skins to bypass the river. A minor inconvenience that did little to delay Nader's inevitable siege of Baghdad, where, from its battlements, Ahmed Pasha and the Ottoman defenders began watching with horror in February 1733, as the massive Persian army began its slow constriction of the city, building a ring of towers all around Baghdad, with the goal of starving it into submission. Months later, even beginning work to divert the flow of the Tigris River away from the city so as to eliminate their access to water. Which may be raising the question for you, why didn't Nader try to more quickly move things along by unleashing an artillery bombardment of the city? Well, for a number of reasons, underscored by the fact that travel through the Zagoros Mountains made it extremely difficult to drag along any artillery pieces through that type of terrain, and next to impossible for the heaviest type of artillery necessary for punching through city fortifications. As such, neither opting for constriction due to the limitations of the artillery that he had with him, although effective for field operations, were relatively few in number and not able to match the caliber and range of the Ottoman pieces found within the city, an important part of its formidable fortifications, which also helps to explain why Nader didn't attempt to storm Baghdad, as this would have been at a high cost to his army though it has been argued by some historians that this was a definitive error made by Nader, in that he didn't appear to have a contingency plan to address this artillery-based deficit, thereby necessitating a long-winded siege that gave the Ottomans ample time to prepare a heavy response six months later in July 1733. The Ottoman Sultan Mahmud I from his capital in Istanbul, sending his very best, his most experienced and skilled commander of the time. Topol Osman Pasha, the 70-year-old, grizzled veteran and victor of countless battles, at the head of 80,000 high-quality soldiers, drawn from the European portion of their empire, including Sepahi cavalry, large contingents of their elite Janissary infantry, and 60 cannons and mortars. With Nader, upon learning of their approach, not hesitating to leave 30,000 of his soldiers behind to keep the siege going, while leading the rest, 70,000, directly towards the Turkish army. In mid-July 1733, the two massive groups coming face-to-face -face near a city called Samara, 125 kilometers north of Baghdad. Topol Osman Pasha, in the day prior to battle, forming up about half of his army, 40,000 of his troops in a seemingly disadvantageous position, 
with their backs against the Tigris River and no escape route in sight, practically inviting Nather to attack. An invitation more accurately described as a clever deception that was fully intended by Topol, the wily and undeniably talented general that he was, who then used the night before the engagement to bolster his army's count, positioned against the Tigris, from 40 to 60,000, with another 20,000 infantry kept in reserve. And although it's not understood exactly how, by somehow obscuring them from view, and thus underrepresenting the true total fighting strength of the Ottoman force. A cunning ruse that baited Nather to commence an attack in the early morning dawn of July 19th, believing that he had the upper hand in terms of the battleground site and numbers. With Nather, as usual, leading the fierce assault from the front, and all of his 50,000 musketmen in to engage the opposing Ottoman Janissaries. The two sides spending some time firing into one another. However, Nather soon ordering his infantry to charge in and get to close quarter hand-to-hand combat, wanting to spend as little time as possible in ranged musket attacks due to the Ottomans' overwhelming advantage in artillery and the destruction that it would have caused among his troops. This, while also sending the bulk of his 20,000 cavalry in one overwhelming wave to attempt crashing into the Ottoman left. A move that was checked by Topal Sapahi cavalry, also estimated at around 20,000, in a fierce collision of opposing horsemen, resulting in a frighteningly high rate of casualties on both sides, and that grinded the cavalry fight into a stalemate. Whereas in the center, four hours into the brutal and bloody slog, some momentum, as the 50,000 Iranian infantrymen began inching forward, slowly pushing the 40,000 Janissaries and other Ottoman musketmen back, threatening to break the Turkish army, at the cost of unimaginable carnage experienced by both sides, while straining and pushing all beyond the limits of their physical endurance happening under the intense blazing July sun of this dry desert climate, regularly producing daily temperatures hovering around a sweltering 40 degrees Celsius. Which gives us a hint as to the factors leading to the outcome of this encounter, the availability of water, which the Ottomans possessed and Nader's troops lacked, unable to get access to the river, the inability to hydrate becoming more and more of a problem for the Persian troops as the intense fighting continued. A problem that was exacerbated for them when Topol, in seeing his army nearing its breaking point into the fifth hour of battle, having patiently waited over the course of the laborious battle, wisely determined this point, the key moment to finally throw his fresh reserve of 20,000 infantry into the field. Follow by a defection within Nader's ranks. An Arab tribal leader, probably among the cavalry, that had been convinced to flip their allegiance. And to their credit, although the Iranian troops, despite being pushed back and cut down, some dropping from exhaustion and thirst, managed to maintain their form and composure. The last straw leading to their full collapse was their leader, Nader, in the midst of this stage of the battle having been thrown from his horse in a terrible collision. Described by James Fraser in his book, The History of Nader Shah, when Nader's horse was shot from under him, resulting in Nader being violently thrown from his mount and lost in the wild melee, fighting for some time on foot, causing his standard bearer to conclude that he was killed, who rode off with the colors, alarming the whole army who became panic-stricken to the rumors that Nader had been gravely wounded or killed. Panic, which turned to the flight of the Iranian troops, marking the end of the Battle of Samara, the Ottoman victory in a horrific battle that saw over 50,000 left slain on the battlefield, including almost half of Nader's force, 
some 30,000 Persians slain, 3,000 imprisoned, and all of their artillery captured. Though with the Turks experiencing a heavy toll as well, losing nearly a quarter or 20,000 of their entire force resulting in Nader immediately racing from Samara to Baghdad to call off the siege, taking his much-reduced, battered and bruised army of 60,000 and retreating back to the Zagros Mountains. Though not evacuating them from the region entirely, Nader maintaining a large defensive force at the mountain pass near the town of Mandali, in case the Ottomans decided to press inwards. But more so, because although he and his men had only days ago tasted bitter defeat, Nader at Mandali right away began planning for their revival. Personally, burning at the chance to come back and repair the grave harm that had just been inflicted to his reputation and the image he had shaped as being one favored by God, knowing that this loss and the associated hit to his reputation could result in an overwhelming blowback from the fickle Persian aristocracy, if not corrected immediately. But first thing first was repairing the harm among his troops, offering up huge financial compensation to each at the crown's expense, since keeping them loyal was of utmost importance to maintaining his tenuous grasp on power. While allowing the bulk of his soldiers those not tasked with protecting the mountain passes for the eventual return of the army to retire to their homes and rest, ordering them to be prepared to gather at the city of Hamadan in two months' time. Which Nader made straight for, arriving there from the Turkish frontier in early August, using this locale as his base of operations to oversee the monumental task of rebuilding his broken army. Referenced by Herbert Maynard in his book, Nader Shah, by Nader making superhuman efforts to retrieve his reverse, conscious that defeat abroad would soon be followed by revolt at home. Starting with a flood of couriers bearing commands, urgently heading off in directions all across Iran. Some sent to Isfahan to collect the raw recruits stationed there, to Tabriz to recall a portion of the cavalry he had earlier sent to defend the city. Others sent to major armament production sites to replace all their lost hardware, most importantly, muskets and artillery pieces, scraping the state coffers bare to re-equip his army, while ordering yet more troops to be recruited and trained for future use. And since state funds could only go so far, some of his couriers being sent to regional governors, demanding that they pick up some of the tab for this, while also sending fully equipped men to join in Nader's army. This last piece of the puzzle, however, the unwavering demands and heavy taxation that he placed upon the regional governors being particularly contentious, creating notable discontent among the Persian nobility. And when combined with the meaning drawn from his battle loss, tarnishing Nader's prestige, resulting in one serious instance of outright disobedience and rebellion. That mutated into a royalist movement, calling for the deposed Thomas II's reinstatement and Nader's removal, triggered by a disaffected and defiant governor by the name of Sheikh Ahmad Madani. That soon grew to include the provinces of Fars and Hormozagan, the lands that today hug the southern Iranian coastlines along the Persian Gulf and the Gulf of Oman. Granted, a revolt small enough military-wise, with Madani possessing only around 6,000 warriors at his disposal, to not present an immediate threat, nor pull Nader away from his more pressing task of rebuilding his army to re-engage the Ottomans. Instead of directly dealing with the disturbance himself, Nader opting to send one of his top generals who had survived the Battle of Samara, Mohammed Khan Baluk, at the head of 12,000 men to put an end to Madani and his revolt. This while Nader, stationed at Hamadan, continued to doggedly plow 
through the immense organizational and logistical task of revitalizing the Iranian army, which luckily, although with that one notable exception, courtesy of Madani, most governors begrudgingly complied with, fearful of the reprisals that Nader would have undoubtedly served up otherwise. From August to the end of September 1733, the city of Hamadan effectively becoming the center of the Iranian Empire. And when sitting back and imagining it, I can't help but be amazed by how impressive a thing this must have been to witness. Thousands of troops, both veterans and new, streaming in. Thousands of horses, scores of other beasts of burden, pulling in ponderously long lines of wagons and carts, containing equipment, food, small arms, and artillery. Nather managing to have this incredible feat achieved by early October, a mere two months' time from the onset, in what can only be described as a fantastical recovery. His rebuilt army totaling near 95,000, this count including the troops left behind to guard the mountain pass at Mandali, across the width of the Zagros Mountains. The exact unit breakdown of this army, however, like referenced in earlier instances, difficult to pin down based on historical sources, requiring us to venture into more rough estimates. From what I've been able to gather, this force including approximately 30,000 cavalry and 60,000 infantry, though a huge proportion, at least 50% of which were fairly green, untested recruits the remaining 5,000 being support and artillery-based units, including the novel introduction of 1,000 highly mobile, camel-bearing artillery pieces called Zamburaks. You see, as mentioned earlier here and in previous episodes, Nader placed a huge emphasis on maintaining a highly mobile force. Though one perennial problem with this was the transportation of heavy cannons due to the ruggedness of the Iranian plateau, oftentimes requiring Nader to leave these weapons behind, for example, when his 1731 lightning campaign against the Ottomans had been interrupted, forcing him to race across Persia to deal with the Abdali rebellion, and also in his attempt to besiege Baghdad earlier in 1733 unable to drag enough artillery pieces across the rough terrain of the Zagros. A problem to which Zamburaks were the answer to, in order to maintain a strong force of field artillery wherever he went. The Zamburak, which I have read means wasp in the Persian language, was a military unit composed of a light swivel cannon mounted on the back of a camel, along with the operator, called Zamburakchi, who, to fire the one or two pound projectile, would stop, put the camel on its knees, and then turn the cannon with an almost 360 degree range, aiming towards the intended target. And while in isolation, were rather inaccurate and of a shorter range compared to regular field artillery, not of much use against fortifications either, beyond the clear advantage that they had in terms of mobility when deployed en masse in the field, as part of a larger unit of stinging wasps, they could unleash devastating volleys on whatever enemy troops lay in front of them. And while Nader was not the creator of this type of unit, earlier used by groups including the Afghan Pashtuns, such as the Hotaks, and by possibly even Nader himself in a very limited capacity, this was the point that he scaled it up significantly exploding the number of Zamburaks serving under him, and that from there on in would become a large and important fixture within his army. The reconstituted Iranian army that on October 2nd, 1733, departed from Hamadan, with Nader leading them back into the Mesopotamian basin. Though while making their way through the arduous passes of the Zagros Mountains, Nader getting blindsided by a messenger bringing urgent news of Madani's rebellion in the south, reporting that not only did his general, Mohammed Khan Baluk, who was tasked with crushing the revolt, fail to do so, but that he had in fact betrayed Nader, 
joining in with Madani instead, making the insurrection instantly much more of a credible threat, and leaving Nader with an extremely difficult decision on his hands. Proceed against the Ottomans at the risk of the rebellion getting out of hand, maybe even to the point of ousting him from his position while abroad, or abandon the march and head south to crush Madani and the traitorous Mohammed Khan. Nader making the decision to press on with his renewed campaign against the Ottomans. And although we of course can't know exactly what was going through his mind, I tend to lean towards the notion that this was in the urgent desire to repair the grave harm done to his image, with the loss against Topol Osman Pasha hanging over his head, thus tainting the structured veneer of Nader being one favored by God to lead. Owing to the idea best encapsulated to us by a quote from Vince Lombardi, widely considered to be the greatest coach in American football history, one of the greatest coaches and leaders in the history of all American sports, who said, No leader, however great, can long continue unless he wins battles. The battle decides all. And although the revolt was gaining in momentum, thankfully, Nader had other talented commanders to call upon, including his most loyal and favored general, mentioned in the last episode, Thomas Khan Jaleir, who Nader sent off to protect Isfahan, oversee the enlistment and training of new troops, and do his best to contain the rebellion. Which, as a quick side note, allows us to understand the benefits of Nader raising people to higher positions based on merit versus doing so simply on the basis of social class, which, as we know, had played a large part, contributing heavily to the decline and degradation of the Safavid Persian army previously. This also allowing Nader to not let anything distract him from the path he had set out for himself, as he and his 95,000 strong army emerged from the mountains into the Mesopotamian basin in mid-October 1733. But in doing so, undoubtedly knowing that he was on the very edge of the precipice in undertaking this endeavor, in that if he were to fail again, his tenuous support would have dried up completely, in all likelihood leaving him as a target to be hunted down and executed, be it at the hands of the Ottomans or the people of his nation. Thoughts that must have been reverberating both in his mind and in that of his officers and troops, and perhaps what spurred Nader upon arriving at the town of Mandali to assemble his army and give what was reportedly a stirring speech, where he began, surprisingly, by admitting of his mistakes earlier at Samara, openly accepting responsibility for the loss, then, looking to the future, promising to wipe away the memory of their recent defeat. The emotion of the moment, coupled with being on the eve of a momentous battle, apparently working extremely well to inspire and inject his army with a much-needed boost of morale, as they left Mandali, marching northwest towards the city of Kirkuk, almost 300 kilometers away, where Topol Osman Pasha and his troops were based. Topol, using the time since Samara to replace his losses from the previous battle and add to his forces, since he became well aware that Nader was planning a return, thereby increasing his army's count to just over 100,000. Though notably, with a deficit in cavalry, the Ottoman Sultan Mahmud, despite Topol's repeated requests for more horsemen to replace those lost at the Battle of Samara, only sending infantry reinforcements. A factor that would produce grave consequences for the future, and very likely something that Nader had caught wind of early on into this renewed campaign. With Nader sending forth a fury of scouting parties in order to get a constant stream of reports on the position and movements of the enemy, while driving his troops onwards at an aggressive pace, then ordering one of his officers to lead an advance guard in the low thousands closer still. Topol, in turn, 
unleashing 12,000 of his soldiers to meet the Persian advance, which in view of the larger Ottoman contingent began retreating, taking them through a valley called Arg Darband, where the first blows of the Battle of Kirkuk were struck on October 24, 1733. Arg Darband being the site of a brutal ambush, with Nader anticipating the path of the Turkish pursuit, having placed 15,000 infantry on each crest adjacent to and overlooking the valley, allowing the 30,000 Iranian musketeers to make short work of and inflict high casualties on the Ottoman forward contingent, almost half of which was left slain in the mountain valley, and the survivors scrambling back to Topal's main army, arrayed just outside of Kirkuk, with Nader after having taken some time to reorganize his army for the climactic battle ahead, advancing his 95,000 troops to cover the last few remaining kilometers north to meet the Ottomans. The two enormous armies coming into each other's view two days later on October 26th, Topal establishing a long line of Janissaries and regular Turkish infantry across the length of the field, 70,000 strong, with an estimated 15,000 kept back in reserve, and artillery set up in between these lines, while splitting his much-reduced force of 15,000 cavalry into two groups, protecting the respective flanks of his formation. Nader, in seeing this, opting to form up his troops in a similar fashion, though keeping nothing in reserve, spreading all of his 60,000 infantry across the length of the Ottoman line, artillery in between, and also splitting his much larger force of 30,000 cavalry into two wings of 15,000, Nader himself leading the horsemen on the left, then boldly commanding his entire army to move forward across the field. The Iranian infantry, led by the Jazayirchi, stopping short of the Ottoman line, where an intense musketry duel was ignited across its entire length. But unlike the Battle of Samara, the Persian troops able to hold their ground, not forced into preemptive hand-to-hand -hand combat, since they were no longer outgunned from a field artillery standpoint, thanks to the Zamburaks, which Nader had commanded into the fight. Supporting the Persian lines were most pressed by stopping unleashing their wasp-like stings from their light cannons and then moving elsewhere along the battle lines before the Ottoman field cannons were able to lock on to where they had been. This alongside the impressive range of the Jazayirchi, adding devastating weight to the sustained chorus of Persian firepower. The two opposing lines of infantry discharging repeatedly into one another for nearly two hours but with the Ottomans experiencing the far worst of the casualties. And once sufficiently softened up, Nader then calling for his infantry to brandish their swords and charge in, along with the Persian cavalry wings that both surged forward on their respective sides of the battleground, readily dispatching the outnumbered Ottoman cavalry, dominating the field and clearing the path to begin heavily crashing into the flanks of the Ottoman infantry line that began to break apart and fall back in disarray to where the 15,000 Ottoman reserve troops were lined up. Aided, of course, by the repeated Persian cavalry charges that continued to tear into the sides of the Ottoman army. Nader in the thick of things, hacking away with his famous battle axe he was accustomed to wielding in battle. Then, ordering detachments from the left and right wings to be sent further around, undertaking deep pincer movements to outflank and begin charging into the backs of the Ottomans as well. A genius maneuver that effectively placed the Ottoman army into a cauldron of Iranian troops, viciously hammering away at the enormous mass of Turkish infantry from all sides that worked to spell out the quickly nearing collapse of the Ottoman army, accelerated and brought to its inevitable conclusion when, in the midst of battle, Topol Osman Pasha was shot down from his horse, before having his head severed, skewered by the lance of a Persian cavalryman 
and brought before Nather as a grisly trophy. The Battle of Kirkuk ending as a truly overwhelming and lopsided victory for Nather, the Iranian forces incurring no more than 1-2,000 to 2, losses, in contrast to conservative estimates of over 20,000 Turkish troops slain, thousands more taken prisoner, and all of their artillery pieces captured. Bringing us to the scene that we covered at the very top end of the episode. With Nader, shortly after the battle's end, ordering Topol's head to be returned to the blood-soaked battlefield and reunited with his body, reportedly taking some time to quietly look upon the corpse of the celebrated Ottoman general. Perhaps, overcome with emotion, paying his respects to his worthy adversary, while understanding that, in having triumphed at Kirkuk, he had just reversed the huge setback to his stature and image, that would immediately work to re-strengthen his claim to authority and regain the support of the Persian aristocracy. Nader then ordering Topol's body to be sent with full honors to Baghdad for burial, but not choosing to follow behind to set siege to the city, realizing that it would likely take months to fall, also wagering that he now had more than enough of an advantage to be able to negotiate a favorable peace treaty with the Ottomans that would see them hand back all of the Iranian Caucasus domains with peace negotiations initiated soon after the battle. Plus, there remained the threat of the aforementioned uprising in southern Iran that needed to be quelled before it got further out of hand, wherein, despite the best attempts of Nader's general, Thomas Khan Jalayar, left behind at Isfahan, since he could only do so much with the meager military resources at his disposal, to contain the rebellion that had managed to grow and gain in momentum, this prompted Nader in mid or late November to abandon Kirkuk and cross back through the Zagros Mountains to begin making the 1,200-kilometer trek to the city of Shiraz in southwestern Iran. Nader, after having crossed the mountains back into Iran, leaving about half of his army behind to rest from the campaign trail, and undergo their regular cadence of training and drilling, while leading the rest, estimated to be somewhere in the realm of 40 to 50,000 of his more mobile troops, both cavalry and infantry, to the south. Where, by this point, the revolt had grown to a total combined strength of 25,000 troops, split up into two main bodies, one of no more than 10,000 under Sheikh Ahmad Madani, who had kicked off the insurrection, and another under Nader's traitorous general, Mohammed Khan Baluk, consisting of about 15,000. Nader's unexpectedly quick arrival at Shiraz in early 1734, interrupting the preparations that they were making to assault the capital of Isfahan, and causing the two forces to scatter, Madani scrambling southeastwards and Mohammed Khan fleeing south resulting in Nader recalling his general, Thomas Khan Jalayar from Isfahan, and distributing the available Persian soldiers between them, needing two quick-moving armies to be able to chase down the elusive rebel forces. A decision that worked exceedingly well, and that, in short order, proceeded to thoroughly trounce the rebel armies proving themselves not even a close match to the professionalism, skill, and discipline of Nader's troops. Although the exact sequence of events is a little muddled according to the historical accounts, from what I've been able to gather, the dominance of Nader's troops soon put on display in May 1734, with Tamas Kanjalayar chasing down and crushing Madani's army near his stronghold at Maraga. Today, a village at the southern tip of Iran, where it meets with the Persian Gulf. Madani captured, sent to Nader, and quickly executed. While Nader later managed to catch up with his former general the following month in June, somewhere to the south of Shiraz, and do the same, easily routing the rebel force and capturing Mohammed Khan. Then, in a feat of rage, 
having the eyes of the traitorous Mohammed Khan gouged out, leaving him in a terrible state of pain, languishing in misery over the next three days before succumbing to the horrific injuries. An event that did little to calm Nather's foul mood, who then ordered harsh reprisals upon all of the cities, towns, and tribes that had supported the rebellion, regardless of whether willing or unwilling participants, in the form of ponderously heavy taxation, confiscation of goods and resources, and the execution of any prominent figures involved and the transplanting of people and tribes from the area, forcing them to move to other lands in the effort to lessen the chances of a particularly troublesome region again revolting in the future. The message, brutally clear, not only to those in southern Iran, but to all across the empire, that this was the fate awaiting those attempting to subvert Nader's will. And with the rebellion fully squashed into submission, allowing Nader to return to Isfahan in the midsummer of 1734, where he had no intention of resting, but rather immediately readying his over 100,000 strong army to make their way north. Nader becoming convinced that the Ottomans had no intention of handing back the Iranian Caucasus domains since Istanbul was dragging its heels in terms of peace negotiations. And although the discussions had indeed been initiated following the Ottoman defeat at Kirkuk, without the presence of Nader and his army running loose within their domains, combined with the Turkish forces being well entrenched in the Caucasus, it seems that this gave Sultan Mahmud the confidence to keep the war going prompting Nader to march out from Isfahan in late August to forcibly take what the Ottomans were unwilling to relinquish, leading his powerful army 1,200 kilometers due north from the Iranian capital. On November 3rd, arriving at the gates of the city of Ganja in modern western Azerbaijan, where Nader and around 40,000 of his forces began setting siege to the city. But, not stopping there, also dividing the remaining 60,000 plus of his army into two groups, each sent to the respective cities of Tbilisi in modern Georgia, 200 kilometers northwest of Ganja, and Yerevan, Armenia, 250 kilometers southwest of Ganja, to launch sieges there, unbelievably having three simultaneous sieges going on at once. Although no doubt expecting an attack from Nader, certainly not expecting such a bold undertaking, creating a firestorm of concern reaching Sultan Mahmud in the Ottoman capital, who ordered the raising of a grand army under a general by the name of Koprulu Abdullah Pasha. But that would require some time to assemble over the next six months, a period during which Nader traveled from site to site to oversee the progress of the sieges, but also actively immersing himself into the assaults. The accounts of what was happening at Ganja particularly sobering, Ganja being notable for possessing elaborate fortifications and an Ottoman garrison of 14,000 that was proving to be an exceedingly tough nut to crack. According to the words of Lawrence Lockhart in his book Nader Shah, a siege wherein active mining and countermining went on, leading to underground hand-to-hand combat, and on one occasion, the detonation of six Iranian mines that did great damage to the walls and killed 700 Turks, followed by another instance where Nader narrowly escaped death outside the city walls just getting missed by a cannonball that decapitated the soldier by his side, rendering Nader splattered with the unfortunate man's brains and blood. And although steady progress was being made at all locations, as of May 1735, each continued to withstand the Persian onslaught. This being the point at which the Ottoman general finally emerged from the city of Kars, in modern eastern Turkey leading an army of 80,000 towards Yerevan, a distance of about 200 kilometers, 
his force comprised of 50,000 Sipahi cavalry, 30,000 janissaries, and about 40 field cannons. Learning of their departure, Nader reportedly thanking Allah for this moment, the opportunity for a decisive field battle, which, as we know, was clearly where he excelled, and that would ultimately prove to be the last major engagement of the Ottoman-Persian War. Nader ordering skeleton crews to remain at the three aforementioned cities, while organizing an army of 55,000 to gather at Yerevan, the city to which Koprulu Abdullah Pasha was making a concerted effort to rapidly get to, approaching from the north in the aim of surprising Nader, a tactic that apparently almost worked, because while Nader had indeed ordered 55,000 Iranian troops to be assembled for the upcoming battle, he may have underestimated the speed of the Ottoman arrival, since he only had an advanced guard of 15,000 with him, at Yerevan ready to move out. Though not a force to be taken lightly, composed mainly of infantry, a high proportion of which were his elite Jazayirchi, around 2,000 cavalry, two dozen field cannons, and nearly 1,000 Zamburaks. That Nader audaciously led 20 kilometers north from Yerevan to Yagavard, the site that would later give this battle its name and to where the 80,000 Ottoman troops were now approaching, outnumbering Nader's group more than 5 to 1. Nader, despite fully understanding what was en route to meet them, resolute in his conviction to make a stand there, quickly assessing the landscape, with his penchant for skillfully taking advantage of the topography once again coming into play, selecting a high ground plateau for his army one that overlooked a large flatland plain and a nearby forest situated off to the side, on the periphery of what would become the battlefield, while, of course, also issuing out urgent orders for his generals to join them with the remaining 40,000 Iranian troops once organized. However, with Koprulu Abdullah Pasha reaching Yagavard first, and in learning that it was indeed Nader in the field with so few numbers around him, the Ottoman general began rushing to get his army into formation, hastily drawing up battle plans in the effort to avoid any delays and strike now when Nader was at his most vulnerable. In what must have been a chaotic scene of commands and a fury of movement amongst the Ottoman soldiers, attempting to form up in the flatland plain in front of Nader's much smaller force positioned on the high ground. The Ottomans straining to organize themselves, with a large block of 30,000 Janissary infantry in the center, and two wings of 25,000 Sepahi cavalry on each side. The Turkish commander also pointing to a hill in front of his left cavalry wing, where his artillery were to be drawn up to. And as a quick side note, I'll be sure to include a visual aid on the show's website, so you can have a better sense of how the forces were arrayed. Astoundingly, this being the point that Nader decided to strike, his golden opportunity to assault the huge but terribly disorganized army that lay in front of him, that were desperately trying to get themselves into order. In what would end up as yet another masterclass of Nader's military brilliance, combined arms in a sequence of quick maneuvers and decisive objectives executed by an exceptionally trained and disciplined army that followed his commands unerringly. With the exception of his 2,000 horsemen, neither ordering all of his troops forward to begin harassing the jumbled Ottoman army, while the Iranian field cannons were pulled to the edge of the plateau, firing overhead his advancing soldiers, then calling on his Zamburaks to descend from the high ground to the Ottoman center where they began unleashing their stinging light cannon projectiles into the mass of Janissaries ahead, which pushed the Ottoman infantry back. While the combined might of the Iranian infantry and artillery readily mowed down any Sapahi cavalry units that were sent their way, Nader then peeling off 3,000 Jazayirchi from the main frontal attack, who suddenly turned with the sole purpose of capturing the hill where the Ottoman cannons had been placed, 
doing this with ruthless efficiency and thus neutralizing the Ottoman artillery that only managed to shoot off a mere two rounds before silenced. In contrast to the Iranian field cannons that, as a result of their training and placement, were able to achieve an astounding rate of fire, at least 300 rounds during the course of the battle, crashing into the Ottoman forces, worsening their disorganization. All of this topped off by the final piece of his amazing plan, with Nader himself leading his 2,000 cavalry in a wide flanking maneuver, using the cover of the nearby forest to appear at the back of the Ottoman army targeting the centermost group that had fallen back as a result of the ruinous Zamburak volleys, and where the Ottoman general Koprulo Abdullah Pasha was positioned, his standard acting as a beacon for Nader, who charged out with his 2,000 horsemen from the cover of the forest in a violent and targeted burst of action to cut down the Turkish commander. The Ottoman army, already shocked and demoralized, now leaderless, causing them to break apart and flee the field. And while some rather heavy casualties were experienced in this initial day of battle, the losses became multiplied times over in the days that followed, when the rest of the Persian army finally appeared in field, that were used to hunt out and exterminate the splintered pieces of the Ottoman army, resulting in only 10% or 8,000 out of their original 80,000 that were able to make it back to the city of Kars. In contrast to extremely light casualties among the Iranian soldiers in the low hundreds. The Battle of Yagavard ending as a spectacular victory for Nader. Shortly afterwards, followed by successes at the cities of Ganja and Tbilisi, the Ottoman garrison surrendering after learning of the disaster that had befallen their countrymen. And shortly after that, in October 1735, with the Ottoman Sultan Mahmud I reeling from all of the dire setbacks, particularly the devastating battle loss, not to mention their involvement in a newly ignited war against the Russian Empire that had begun earlier that year in May, all of this became too much for the Ottomans to handle, resulting in Sultan Mahmud making overtures for peace with Nader beginning with the surrender of the region entirely, and promptly evacuating all of Iran's Caucasus holdings, which were handed over to Nader's control. Thus ending the Persian-Ottoman War, later formalized in the Treaty of Constantinople. After the conclusion of the Ottoman-Persian War, Nader continuing to campaign in the area, spending the latter half of 1735 securing nearby southern Dagestan against a tribal group called the Lesgians, in the aim of fully completing the reconquest of Iran's northwestern domains, doing what few across Persia had even thought possible, and leaving only the region of Kandahar to be reclaimed, still in the hands of the Hotaks. His unprecedented successes, particularly those against the Ottomans, strengthening Nader's power and authority, along with the idea of him being favored by God to lead, to a level that was now essentially unassailable, making Nader confident that the time had finally come to claim the Iranian throne, pushing the child king Abbas III, the Safavids, and their divine right to rule all off the figurative cliff. But how to formalize this? The solution reportedly crystallized one evening in Nader's tent, after a great hunting party on the Mogan Plain, a wide and fertile valley that today straddles the border between northwestern Iran and southern Azerbaijan, wherein, surrounded by a small group of his closest and most trusted advisors, including Tamas Khan Jalair and Hassan Ali Beg Bastami, Bastami suggested a kurultai, in the tradition of the Mongols also used by other great Asiatic conquerors such as Tamerlane, a large outdoor gathering, including all of the most prominent and influential figures within the given nation, in order to obtain and align on the formal will of the people, regarding important decisions such as with the selection of kings. Taking Bastami's advice, 
neither having commands issued out across the furthest reaches of the Iranian Empire in November 1735. And pretty much without fail, all of those called upon promptly adhering to Nader's summons. Nearly 20,000 of the leading Persian aristocracy and religious authorities filtering into the Mogan plain, with the Kurultai in full swing by February 1736. Nader using this gathering as a projection of his power and prestige. According to Lawrence Lockhart, in ordering 12,000 buildings of wood and reeds, together with mosques, rest houses, bazaars, and baths to be erected at this place. While presiding over lavish festivities, with no lack of sumptuous food, drink, entertainment, and other luxuries that were brought in for the attendees, such as rose water perfumes and sherbet that were distributed to everyone. And Nather's imposing army and field, stationed nearby, ostensibly protecting the Kurultai, but that was also used as a means to intimidate those present into building consensus over what soon became clear was the real intended purpose of the meeting, Nader's ascension to the throne. Initiated by a prearranged collection of staunch supporters, some of the leading Persian nobility and those within the upper command of his military, including Tamas Khan Jalayar, who at the climax of the Kurultai began leading the call for Nader to be named as king, arguing the case that God's will was clear in that Nader was the only real option to lead the Iranian Empire and continue to protect it from its enemies, and that this was not an argument really up for debate. Made resoundingly clear in one instance of infamy during the proceedings that followed, wherein a high-ranking Shia cleric began loudly arguing against Nader's elevation, citing his lineage, or lack thereof, lacking the bloodline and the right to rule of the Safavid dynasty, linked back to Ali, regarded by Shia Muslims as the Prophet Muhammad's rightful successor and the first Imam. His arguments quickly ending in a garbled gasp, when a nearby guard was waved in to silence the dissenter by strangling him in full public view, thereby making a harsh example of the cleric and understandably resulting in no further opposition brought forward to contest Nader's appointment, who was shortly afterwards universally acclaimed as the Shah of Iran, followed by the coronation of the 48-year-old Nader on March 8, 1736, related to us firsthand by an Armenian priest that left an account of the momentous event, described as follows. In the main gathering hall of the Kurultai, a golden crown, shaped like a helmet and adorned with precious stones and magnificent pearls was placed on Nather's head, while all those present knelt down and prayed, save the chief Mullah, who intoned the prayer, followed by a lively and elaborate celebratory feast. Before taking their leave, all present bowing in reverence and respect before their new Shah, Nader, officially assuming the title of Nader Shah, founder of the Afsharid dynasty and the Afsharid Iranian Empire. Despite all of the challenges placed in his way throughout his life, a poverty-stricken youth, meager lineage, so many reversals of fortune experienced during his career that would have most certainly broken lesser individuals, Nader, unwilling to be crushed asunder, persevering through each point of adversity to find himself now sitting upon the throne of Iran. However, not satisfying his insatiable appetite for power in the least, driven to go after more in order to broaden and build upon his future legacy, endeavoring to solidify the Iranian empire as an indomitable, militaristic superpower, and thus marking his place in history. And there was still much to do, neither from the Mogan Plain in the northwestern reaches of his newly won empire, looking across the vista far to the southeast, 2,300 kilometers away to where Kandahar was awaiting, and beyond, 1,400 kilometers further still 
to where the fabled riches within the city of Delhi would be found, the capital of the Mughal Empire, another superpower that Nather was determined to subdue. In the next episode, we'll continue following along with Nather's amazing story as he begins disrupting the Shia Islam dominant religious landscape of Iran in the goal of entrenching both his and his dynasty's future hold on power. A move that, let's just say, gets implemented with some mixed reviews, while continuing his ceaseless pace of military campaigning, completing the full reclamation of the lost Iranian domains with the reconquest of Kandahar from the last remnants of the Hotak dynasty before moving on to the aggressive expansion of his Afsharid Iranian empire, first daring to challenge the fabulously wealthy and powerful Mughal empire, adding two more famous battlefield victories to his impressive resume at Khyber Pass and Karnal, leading to the sack and brutal pillage of Delhi in 1739. From there, proceeding north into Central Asia, to conquer the Uzbek-based Khanats of Bukhara and Kiva, thus reaching the pinnacle of his career, his empire now at a size and scale hearkening back to the Sasanians and Achaemenids of antiquity. Underneath all of these successes, however, a growing darkness, hints beginning to emerge as to Nather's worsening state of mind, evidenced by violent outbursts leveled upon foes, and then family friends and supporters, while his constant push for warfare and the expansion of the army, alongside an increasingly oppressive rule, begins to render severe harm and dire lasting consequences on the future viability of his empire. This and more to come in the next episode of the Warlords of History podcast. If you want to support the podcast, there are many ways you can do so. You can tell your family and friends about the show. Please rate, review, and subscribe on whichever platform you happen to access the show on. You can follow the podcast on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook. And lastly, you can head on over to the show's website, warlordsofhistory.com, where I'll include some additional info, like images and maps pertaining to this episode for your viewing pleasure and where you can also reach out to me with any thoughts, questions, or suggestions. I would love to hear from you. Thanks for listening, and I hope you enjoyed the episode. Theme music from audionautics.com